Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Good afternoon. My name is Ivo, and I'm an alcoholic. Yeah. Woo. <laughs> it's, it's really lucky to be here. Um, when I got the message on my phone that I've been asked to share at the convention, uh, I was a little bit concerned because Richard had written in here that um, we must use no abusive or offensive language, so I'm not going to say much. <laughs> um, I can remember when I first came into Alcoholics Anonymous, I couldn't say a sentence without a swear word in it. And uh, I want to thank Alcoholics Anonymous today that I can talk without having to swear. It's absolutely awesome. Um, yeah, the topic is why is this simple program so hard? Well, I believe the only reason why it's hard is because I make it hard. There's no other reason. And um, I, can only uh, I can only share my experience, strength and hope with fellow alcoholics and that's what I'll do, because the rest will be all just opinions. And, um, you know, I started drinking at the tender age of 14. I think it's quite a common age uh, between alcoholics. And uh, I can clearly remember when I bought that bottle of Vin Coco on the corner of Cape Road and William Moffat. I'm a port Elizabethan from the Mount Coy group. I wasn't allowed to go in and buy that bottle. I got somebody to go in and buy it for me. We went into the bush alongside William Moffat, and when I drank that bottle of vin cocoa, it did something to me. It livened me up, it gave me a complete different perspective on life. And I went to the party that night and I had an absolute joy. I woke up the next morning, my bed was uh, full of puke, and my mother came into the room and she reprimanded me and I told her there's something I ate. I'm sure she knew what, uh, what had happened. And the reason why I tell you that story is because the next Friday night I did exactly the same thing. But this time I didn't uh, find it necessary to pass out. I continued with the party, had a hell of a hangover the next day, but I enjoyed myself. So it didn't stop there, it became a Saturday night thing. Then it became a Wednesday night thing because it was ladies night. And this is all when I was still in my infancy stage of high school. I eventually got expelled in a seven second break. Um, I was asked to leave the school, and I was happy about that because I was taken to a place called the Russell Road Technical College. I could grow my hair long, I could smoke cigarettes, I could run to the hideaway pub and grub at break time and go have a beer, and there weren't many rules and regulations, and that's what Ivo liked. So I continued along that path at Russell Road Technical College. I eventually became an apprentice toolmaker before going to my national service. My national service... I really learned how to drink properly, and um, if you're an alcoholic, I tell you, you can maintain quite well. The people that don't drink, you eventually end up drinking their quota as well, so it's, it's quite awesome. And um, I came back into the tool-making field, and three weeks before my, my trade test, I absconded. I went in a, a three-week job, and I never went back to work. My toolbox is still lying there. I never went back to go fetch it. I eventually ended up becoming a parts salesman. And I can remember sitting at work, I was a parts, uh, I was a salesman, then I became a parts manager for a while, and I was sitting at work and I saw there was an advert for a bottle store manager. And I thought to myself, man, this is my line of work. The salary was a little bit less, the perks were a little bit less, but I thought, man, I'm still, I'm gonna enjoy this, so let me, and I applied for it and I got the job. The nice thing about being a bottle store manager is you can wrangle the books and you can drink for free. And that's what I did for a very long time. As a matter of fact, I was quite good at my job. And uh, one of the wholesalers approached me to become a liquor rep for them. I must say, by this time, when I got that job, I'd already received about four criminal records. I don't brag about them. It was just my, my behavior patterns that got me into this type of thing. And when I became a liquor rep, they gave me a, a beautiful company car, they gave me a beautiful abuse, they gave me a credit card, uh, they gave me a petrol card, 
And they said to me, see me now, you like the pub so much, you can go, and from morning until evening, you can go join in the pubs and you can sell your booze to them. And I loved it. I drove, drove out there and I went, the first, the first stop was my mother's house. I pulled into my mother's house and I said to her, Mom, look at this. I mean, look at, you know, you're always talking negative. Look what's happened to me in my life. I mean, look at this job that I've got. And my mother started crying. <laughs> and I thought to myself, goodness gracious, man, this, you know, this woman's always negative. I, mean, I can't believe it, you know. And I can remember getting into my car and wheel spinning away from my house. I was angry. Seven years later, uh, as a matter of fact, just after she started crying, she said to me, Ivo, this is going to be the end of you. That were her words, just before I left. And um, seven years later, or almost eight years later, I ended up in a facility. And it was almost the end of me. Her words rang too. You know, I lay in that facility, I still had the company car outside. I'd rung up a good 50,000 rands with a credit card debt. I'd rung, rung up about 60,000 rands worth of uh, booze debt from my work because I was rolling the accounts. And, um, you know, I'm an alcoholic that goes to extremes. So I, was, um, I was visiting a place in the northern areas called, uh, those days, nowadays it's called Hendonvale. In those days it was called Katanga. Well, it's just got a better name now. But uh, that's where I used to hang out, and that's where I used to take a bottle, of, uh, a case of Johnny Walker Red Label, and I used to go swap it for some drugs of my choice. And that's where alcohol had led me. I came into the fellowship. I went to the facility not because I wanted to stop drinking. I went to the facility because I wanted to run away from my problems. The, the no drinking story wasn't. I, I didn't believe that was ever going to happen, so I didn't want to think about it. But when I was in the facility, I met up with a place called Alcoholics Anonymous. And one of your speakers from yesterday, he's here today, he's running the canteen at the moment. He, when I was in the facility, he was the food and beverage manager at the beach hotel. And I owed this guy six bottles of Richelieu brandy because I borrowed it from him as a liquor rep who can go around and do this type of thing. And I was lying in this facility and I saw Anton walking through the door and I thought, goodness gracious, this guy's coming to fetch you six bottles of Richelieu. <laughs> So I pulled the blankets over my head and he walked next to me and he came and spoke to this gentleman next to me and he, they went out to the veranda and they went and spoke and I sneaked up on them, I wanted to see what was going on. And while Anton was talking to this guy, this guy started crying and I thought, goodness, maybe he owes him something as well, you know. <laughs> so I watched them for about a half an hour and then when they were finished they came back through and I quickly pulled the blankets over my head and Anton left. And I said to this guy, I said, what was that all about? And he said, no, this guy's been clean and sober for a while, you know, and he's talking to me about my problem. And I thought to myself, no, I don't believe it. There's something sinister going on here. But anyway, that Sunday night, this guy said to me, Ivo, don't you want to come with me to an AA meeting? And I said to him, no, man, listen, I'm a liquor rep. I identify all the elks in the pubs. <laughs> and yeah, that's, what, that's part of my job, you know. And um, I said to him, what I'll do is I'll support you. So I'll go with you. you know? I can see you need the support. <laughs> And I walked into that meeting that night and I walked smack bang into Anton. And the first thing I say to him is, hey, Anton, don't worry about those sick bottles, brother. I promise you, I'll pay you back. And you know, he looked at me and he said to me, Ivo, I'm not concerned about those six bottles. As a matter of fact, I don't even want them back. How are you? That's what he said to me. And I'll tell you, those words at that time in my life meant so much. Because nobody was really interested in how I was anymore. The only people who were interested in me were the people that I hung around with in the pubs. Because being a liquor rep, you got lots of friends. But when I went to the facility, not one of them came to visit me. So anyway, I end up in this facility and I, I end up going to my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, which was in Tyler Street, March, sometime in March, around about March in um, 1999. And I haven't found it necessary to have a drink after that. What I did is, I hung around at the, the meetings, and I'm not a meeting type of person. I don't know why, I know today why, but I kept going back to meetings. And I found sobriety there. I walked in there and there was a guy that said, nobody would trust me with 10 rand to go buy them a happy box, because I'd either jump with the 10 rand or the happy box. Today, they trust me with 1.5 million rand to build them a boat, and I deliver the boat. And I still thought to myself, man, 1.5 million rand. Who's ever going to trust me with 1.5 million rand? And you know, I was in the fellowship for a good couple of years, and we were awarded tender 
Nous sommes prêts à On va avoir 5 millions de rand. Donc, le gars a mis 1 million de rand dans mon compte. Et c'était seulement après 4 ans en sobriété. Funny enough, durant ma sobriété, j'ai perdu un business, j'ai perdu une femme, j'ai perdu des maisons, des cars, des bikes, des bouts, vous pouvez nommer tout, tous les matériaux. Mais j'ai allé à une convention une fois, et il y avait un gars qui s'appelait Mark. Et Mark s'est arrivé à la convention et il a dit, j'ai perdu mon fils pour le cancer. Et il était de la Malabar Group, par exemple. Et il a dit, j'ai perdu mon fils pour le cancer. Et il a dit, j'ai perdu mon fils pour le cancer. Et il a dit, j'ai perdu mon fils pour le cancer. And I have just found out that I've got cancer. And I've got about six months to live. And I have not found it necessary to pick up a drink. And you know, when I heard those words, I thought to myself, goodness gracious. You know, yeah, I am sitting thinking about how my life's going. And listen to Mark's life. I went to his funeral and he said the serenity break over his coffin. And I've learned that in sobriety, I need to go to meetings. I need to read my big book. Although I don't have to read from cover to cover like I heard the other gentleman saying to me, no, no, one of my sponsors said to me, you have to do this and you have to do that. As a matter of fact, he suggested it to what I need to do. And thank goodness for that. Thank goodness that you guys gave me the opportunity to hang around long enough that I could sort my own story out. I needed to start loving myself. You guys loved me until I could start loving myself. You advised me that I need to do meetings, I need to read the book, and I need to do service. At one stage, I was doing service seven days a week. I was traveling all over South Africa, going to go speak to people in hospitals, and it was absolutely awesome. I've met some wonderful people. And I've also realized that no human power can relieve me from my alcoholism. So when I go do, I go talk to anybody, It's not up to me to decide whether the guys in this day sober or not. It's in God's hands. And thank goodness for that. I can remember in the beginning when I walked in and I got the big book. I took the big book with me a lot of the times wherever I went. And I'd go find some people to talk to because a lot of people need this program. And I went to my sponsor once and I said to him, yeah, you know, I'm going to go speak to all these people about alcoholism, you know, and, and it's not working. None of them come to the meetings. And he was put a a brazen type of guy, you know, and he just looked at me and he said to me, maybe you haven't got what you're supposed to be giving away. And thank goodness he told me that. Um, I'm forever grateful to Alcoholics Anonymous that you've taught me to try to keep this program simple, which I struggle with. I'm the type of guy that I want to control everything and I want to see the outcome before it happens. And Alcoholics Anonymous has taught me that it doesn't happen. There's one thing I know, And there's one thing that I'll always say is that I don't know if I'll ever have a drink again. I don't want to think about that. As long as I stay clean and sober just for today, that's all that counts. And as long as I'm at that AA meeting, that's all that counts. So today I still make the, the simple program difficult. And that's because sometimes I overcomplicate it myself. I end up not doing my prayer meditation in the morning. I end up taking my life back. And I end up doing things that I'm not supposed to be doing. Yet, I still want to do those things that I'm not supposed to be doing. And I think that's because I'm an alcoholic. It's simple. I've got a disease that has got no cure, but it can be arrested on a daily basis. And for that, I'm forever grateful. And I'm forever grateful to each and every one of you sitting here, because if it wasn't for you guys, there wouldn't be a meeting that I could attend. Thank you very much for this meeting. Good afternoon, friends. I just want to make a few rules. Please bear with me. English is not my, my first language. Although I loved English when I was drinking. So if I don't put the E's and R's in the right places, you can put it there. And then I'm going to take off my spectacles because without that, then it's you all very blurry, so I can imagine you not doing it. Okay. My name is Jolene, I'm an alcoholic. When uh, Richard found me, I, I was laughing because this topic is, this is not so, this is a, isn't hard. Um, and then it came to mind what Dr. Bob said in his last um, message. The simplicity of our program, let's not louse it all up with Freud and complexes.
I grew up in an um, alcoholic household. My father was the alcoholic, and then I, we didn't know about alcoholism because our people, we just drink, it's okay. You have to drink. And I thought that our people drink, it's fine. I'm the only child, and from a very young age, I was in the middle of this marriage. You know that story about, um, tell your mother, tell your father, you don't tell him very well. So that was my story. Now after a weekend, I was actually very scared to talk to my father, because it was like I, um, I sided with the enemy. He must cause us all this problem, and now I want to sit and laugh with him. And my father was a very jolly guy. Without booze or with booze. And, and he was, I could sit and laugh with him. But on a Monday, I, I was thinking, I can't talk to him. Now, just now, my mother think that I'm on his side. And I only realize now that I was stripped by the demands of others. There was no way to peace them. And that was actually double-minded, you know. I would disappoint the other one if I pleased uh, the other one. So it was, um, I was stuck. And you know what I did to get out of it? I started to drink. I, I, because I was still at school, we only, I drank only on a Saturday, because, um, but I was so drunk on, on Saturdays that I passed out. And then later, we, we, as I got older, I started to drink on a Friday. Uh, by the time, in matric, I didn't really remember weekends. But all I knew, knew was that I have to finish matric and I want to go and study. Um, and you know what? It was great to be a student. There was always a plan and there was always a party. And if I look back now, I can already see the pattern. Uh, things happened while I was blacked out. But I could not remember the next day. And then I learned to lie about it. I can remember one instant my friend was assaulted and he was, he was really, it was bad. Why I had a black heart. And I had to, everybody wanted to know we were together. Why I, I, I can't remember what happened. And you know what I did? I lied. I said, I was on medication. And the medicine and the booze didn't tell liquor, so I, that, that bugged me up. And it was one lie after the other. There was no honesty in me at that time. And but one thing I knew, I want to finish this study thing, and of course I want to earn money, and then I can, I can use the liquor. But I only did three years, and I became a teacher, and like they say in Afrikaans, so drums is a clear no on the right side. As drum as a colored teacher, that became me. So there I was, and it just escalated and escalated. So my behavior was different when I was drunk. I just love to talk to people. I went up to people and I checked to them, and it was just a ball. Um, and I couldn't even remember that I spoke to those people. My first sober Christmas holiday, there were ten people that knocked at my door. I didn't even know these people. And there I was over there. I think I was sorry I don't drink anymore. I couldn't remember them. I also uh, I was a walker. I like to walk around when I was drunk. And when somebody made me cross, or I didn't like the vibe, I just walked away. Um, so I ended one up one morning on the stoop of the library in town. I couldn't I couldn't remember what happened. I was in the pub and I woke up the next morning on the on the pavement in front of the library. I thank God of my understanding that I'm still alive. Sometimes I thought back and I think I could have died. And then I wouldn't even know that I was dead. Get into cars and move from the one pub to the other pub, and 
those drivers were just as drunk as I am. So, anything could happen. Then my mother started to pester me with this, uh, to, that I have a problem. I didn't have a problem. I was still working. I, I started to think, why can she call me a drunk? And she didn't make any excuses for me. I, there was no way about it. She, I was a drunken clerk. Um, I was still working. I, I could still pay my bills. I still had my house. I still had my car. I was fine. And then, um, then I was made redundant. I was, I was made redundant. But luckily for me, I could just find another school. Go over to another school. But I feel so sorry for myself, you know. I am in such a hard worker. How could they could get rid of me? There's a lot of other people that don't do so much. And, and, and I, I pity myself now. I realize only now that was just because I didn't work. I was a chain embarrassment. I was drunk at functions. I got drunk, they couldn't rely on me. If I had to do something on a Friday, I was drunk. If I had to turn up on a Saturday morning, I didn't turn up. So I think they got rid of me because of that. But it was okay. I moved on. I was sorry and I drank further. And you know what? This is a story that I think the girls would remember for my first George Forum share. One Friday, I could tie on my hair. I still had the hair at that time. And then I started to drink. And I think somewhere along the line, I had a blackout. And then, I must have rinsed off the tie. Because the next morning, my hair was orange, red, brown, the, all the colors. And you know what? That was a big drinking weekend for me. So what I did? I thought I would go with this hair. It was with orange and brown and red. I went to town and it stood like this. And funny enough, that was the same weekend. I was arrested for drunk and driving. <laughs> yeah. But you know, I came into this program, I didn't want to be coming. Is this timing right? That the orange light is on already. Yeah. I, I plan that I have to change in this program. I wanted to make everything so hard for myself. Uh, but I have to change. I, I'm not a drunk anymore. In the big book on page 27 and 28, it's all about change. A new life has been given us, or if you prefer a design for living. And I have to take this toolkit and work this program. But you know what? I make it hard for myself because I forget about my tools. I don't use my tools every day. Uh, when I was drinking, I never belonged to any organization or any group. And there's a lot of things that I can't do on myself, uh, on my own. And this AA program is one of them. A tradition one say our common welfare should come first. Personal recovery depends on AA unity. It will be very hard to work this program by myself. I need the unity of my crew and the unity of AA. If I don't have you guys, it will be hard for me. I need you people. Uh, my own thinking, actions and deeds might harm the unity of this program. Uh, this, pro this simple program makes life so much easier for us. And in tradition 10, our call is anonymous has no opinion on outside issues. Last year, my colleagues was very upset with me because I didn't get involved in the outside things. I said to myself, if I come into this room, I have a purpose, I have to teach the children. And they were very cross with me. And this program uh, teaches me that I have to do the thing right. I have to live my life right. And luckily I had the steps in it and the tradition. The last part of step 12 said, to practice these principles in all my affairs. I tried to make a program part of my life, 
It is hard when I forget about it because I'm only human. I do forget sometimes that I have a program that I can go back to. And in page 16, they say the principles we have set our ties to progress, we claim spiritual progress rather than spiritual perfection. I'm, I'm very selfish, self-centered. And then in step three, I have made a decision to turn my world and my life over to the care of God of my understanding. That was very hard to do because when I was drinking, it was all about drowning. I was the center of that, of the universe. Everything was me. But I had to hand it over to my higher power. Uh, if a storm into a, if I storm into that situation, everything just goes wrong. And I know I've learned now to just calm, take a deep breath, and think about it. And that makes my life so much easier. And I want to leave you with the following. My dearest one at home always say this. Never have I seen someone too stupid to follow the simple program. But I've seen so many too smart. Thank you people for allowing me to share. Good afternoon friends. My name is Gany. I'm a thoroughbred alcoholic. I bring you greetings from the upper north coast. Uh, of KZN and my home group, the Stanger Group of Alcoholics Anonymous. And as I was seated there, I saw the Elanons, uh, you know, walk in and they said to me they will support me in my share. That is now Friends and Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, in the Stanger Group, I want to remind you that the tea is always hot there and there's a lot of fellowshipping and we enjoy our sobriety. Now I want to tell you a little bit about myself. I don't want to talk uh, about the drunkologues and how I became dishonest and how I did this and how I did that, but I want to tell you what I was. Ego, anger, envy, lies and deceit, self-centeredness, selfishness, self-pity, hatred, fatherless, godless, hopeless and penniless. And that was the trophies that were pasted on my rock bottom. The pit of despair. That's me. That was my desired state. Now, for me to try and condense all of that in 15 minutes with these green lights and red lights and yellow lights going off in, in whatever order is not going to be possible. But the hopeless state of meaningless life, filled with desperation, reaching out for the next drink, without concern for the consequences, uh, led me down a path of total mayhem and destruction. And I was safe in this pit uh, you know, it is emotional pit with this wall, uh, which prevented penetration from the outside. Now, when you wonderful people gave me the simple program of uh, Alcoholics Anonymous program, although battered and beaten, and immediately I saw the circular brick wall, uh, you know, of my emotional pit, with all the posters etched in the wall with deep scars painted with my bloodstains, the hardest thing for me to ever do was to change what I knew what worked for me best. Alcohol gave me that, order, uh, that altered perception of reality, a world of fantasy, uh, you know, a shroud cast over all my hurt, pain and regrets and, uh, and self-pity. That's my story, Mr. Chairman. I've, I've justified why it, it was so hard. But I'm going to go on a little further because I've got 15 minutes. And I'm going to relate to you a drunk -along of what happened to me about 40 years ago, to be precise, between the 17th and 19th of September, 1978, in this very city of Port Elizabeth. And uh, I was 23 years old then, uh, and, uh, you know, that will tell you exactly how old I am. I, I was uh, a very thin, strong, and handsome lad then. Uh, I'm just thin and strong now. You know, uh, at that time I could convince anybody with anything. And uh, I met this girl for a very short period of time. And uh, I convinced her somehow that she must join me, uh, you know, on the spree. We're going on the spree, just pack some clothes and, you, uh, you know, you can come with me. I didn't know her parents, I didn't know where she lived. I knew where she lived more or less, but I didn't know the parents and the family. I didn't even tell my family where I was going. I met her on the roadside, loaded her stuff, and off we went. We spent a couple of days in Durban, 
And then somehow we uh, ended up in Port Elizabeth. In the good old days, I had a book where I had all contact details of the different people I met in my life. It was just a thing of those days. We didn't have cell phones and uh, our memory was not good. So we, we had this book with all the details in there. Uh, I booked up at St. George's. With they had chalets there in those good old days. And uh, when we booked up, the chalets were fully booked. Uh, uh, but I booked in advance, so I had my space there. And that evening, there was a guy that, uh, uh, that came up and he said he needed a place for, 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 you know, for the night. And it was a young couple. And I said, we're well, only using one room. We've got a double room chalet, so you're welcome to join us. So he stayed there. Now that evening, I visited a friend in Malabar. Actually, it's just a contact that I had, a guy that I met once, and I said, well, I'll visit this guy. And I went off with my girlfriend to go and visit this guy. And then, like they always do, uh, they very casually ask you, will you have something? And, 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 and obviously, uh, I wouldn't say no, and I said yes. And then we had one, and we had another, and we had another, and we had another. Uh, subsequently, I got intoxicated. Now the word intoxicated or inebriated are just two words. But we alcoholics know there's a million other words that are associated with that because the mayhem and the disaster actually talks about how intoxicated or inebriated we were. Now, that night I had to drive back to, to Port Elizabeth, and then I remembered that when I drove to uh, uh, Utenaik that evening, uh, there was a freeway, uh, you know, uh, uh, a freeway that was just booked. And as you get to Utenaik, the freeway came to a dead end. This is in 1978, the old timers will remember this. And they were still building it, so it was a dirt road joining up with the other roads, and you got there. And I was so drunk on my return that I saw this road, and when I saw the road, I turned in, and I carried on driving. And every vehicle that came head on flashed their lights and blew their hooter and they went crazy and opened windows and screamed. And I did the same thing. I was flashing my lights and I was pressing the horn and I was, I said, hey, this is a happy bunch of guys in Houston Lake and Port Elizabeth. And I carried on merrily and every guy did that. And I couldn't really understand this. Now, as I got to a place where the, where the going traffic was on a lower, uh, you know, it was uh, lower than where I was, then I realized that I was on the opposite side of the freeway, <laughs> and I was riding head on, on you know, on slow lane, uh, you know, traffic. I veered off the road, got onto my part of the way, and I drove, drove through to Port Elizabeth. Now, as we entered Port Elizabeth, there was one major something. I don't know, it was an accident, something happened, there was blue lights and all color lights and torches flashing. And as I said, I was inebriated, I was drunk, I was shot. And uh, they waved these torches and they were twinkling at me and I just carried on driving as, as best as I could. And when I got to them, they just said, carry on, carry on. And I carried on from there and I got to the chalet. When I got there, I opened the door and I passed out. Now you, now you understand how intoxicated I was. I passed out. Now this girlfriend of mine was shocked. She was stunned because she doesn't know me. And now what does she do with this guy that falls down? Is he dead? Is he drunk? She doesn't know. So she dragged me from there. She's a small person. She dragged me from there, got me into the chalet, locked the door, but the bedroom door is open and I'm half in the bedroom in the passage. And I puke there and I carry on and I pass out there. At four o'clock the next morning, that gentleman and his wife that we offered uh, residence to for that night, they were leaving for Joba. And this guy came there and he wants to say thank you for our good gesture. And there he had to step over me and all this puke. And my, my girlfriend lay there in the bed, she didn't get up. She said, no, it's okay, it's fine, it's okay, I'll, I'll move him now. <laughs> you know, I can just imagine the embarrassment that went through her. But anyway, they, uh, I mean, they left. And for me, it was just not a bother. It was just another thing that happens. When I drink, that's what happens. It's one of those things. But the next day, I, I like we are all alcoholics are, I swore to her that I will never do this again. It was one of those things that happened. It's what I ate and what we drank and all of that that caused me to do that. That won't happen again. That evening... We go to a friend's place in Malabar. This is a friend's friend. 
a friend's uncle actually. And we got there, and then remember the previous night I passed out, I slept on a cold floor, and I was really suffering. And you guys know the bubble us, I was really suffering. And this guy asked me, uh, you, will you have a shot? Hey man, that's like asking a Pope, are you Catholic, you know? And, and obviously I said, yes, I'll have one. But that was the strangest drinking I've ever done. Uh, he poured out of a nap, he made two shots out of the nap, and we drank it. And then he would spin that bottle and it will land by the door and somebody will fetch it. And then when that one is finished, he'll open the next nap and we'll make another drink. Now I don't know how much I drank. Eventually, the car was parked and these houses were, uh, you know, low and uh, the road is on the top and they got staircase leading up. I crawled up the staircase, got to my car and I came with the blue top, which my girlfriend didn't know about, it was hidden there, and we drank on further. Uh, and that evening he said, no, uh, you're not going anywhere, you're not driving home tonight, you're sleeping here with us. And they prepared a room for us and... And I went and stayed. But I was drunk. I was really drunk. I don't know how much I drank, but it was pretty early. It was about 10 ish that night. And about half past two the following morning, the house phone rings. And uh, those days we didn't have cell phones. House phones was a luxury thing to have. We had some communication. And uh, this uncle got up and he answered the phone and he said, Who, Ganny? He's asleep. I was awake. I heard that. When you're drunk, you know, you're not really sleeping, you're not really awake. And I heard this. And I got up. And he says, come, this is a call for you. And there, this friend of mine uh, uh, speaks to me from the other, from Newcastle. And he says, you know what? You need to come back home now. Your girlfriend's mom has passed on. Now, that was something for me. And if you remember, in September 1978, you got petrol up to 6 o'clock in the afternoon, and petrol only opened at 8 o'clock the next morning. And uh, uh, I said to this uncle, I don't know what to do. He said, no, no, no problem. We'll sort it out. He's drunk and I'm drunk. So we get to the police station in Galvandale, I think it was, from Malabar, the next township. And uh, he, we spoke to them, and they got a policeman to escort us to the magistrate's house. And then they had to communicate with him to get hold of the garage owner to open up. And then we got petrol just after four that morning. And then I still had to drive over to the house in Malabar and collect the stuff. And then get over to the chalets, check out and leave for Newcastle. That was the most horrible long distance drive I've ever had in my life. When you're suffering two babalasses, you know, two days in a row and you've got to dr uh, drive that far. Uh, as I uh, got out of Amtata, uh, I said to this girlfriend, just check out anyway, because, you know, the sun is bright and I'm sweating and I'm really suffering. I said, just check for a castle advert, you know. And, and you had this big castle adverts all over the place, be an advert, any advert. And, and we found a place uh, between Amtata and Coxstad. I don't know where this is, but I managed to get a half a bottle of White House and I drank that. And then I started pitying myself and being concerned about the circumstances I'm in because I don't know the parents and the parent has died <laughs> and, the, and, and this girl is with me. So on the way uh, I met a friend driving through Durban from Newcastle and I stopped and I had a chat with him just to break the tension and tell him what, you know, uh, what I'm going through. Of course he didn't care. Eventually I got to Newcastle uh, just before six that evening only to find out that my girlfriend's mother's funeral was over at 3 o'clock that afternoon. So I had to live with this for the rest of my life. But uh, uh, like uh, God would have it, I married her, uh, you know, a while later. She became my wife and, uh, and uh, she's the mother of three of my three, uh, you know, beautiful children. And, and life would go on. But I must remind you that for 13 years in this marriage, I continued the merry way I did in that one weekend in Malabar, for 13 years. I was 23 years old then, and uh, I carried on drinking in, the, uh, you know, in this time. And 13 years into this marriage, uh, you know, uh, I used to go on binge drinking, drinking for a few days in a row. I don't know where I am and what I did. And when I listen to some of the other speakers, 
you know, I heard over this, over the shares uh, here at this convention that, uh, uh, you know, alcoholics, we're genius. We're born genius, but I don't know what happens to us. We just, uh, we just uh, uh, dislocate our brain after a while. I don't know. Uh, so, yeah, uh, I, I carried on drinking and life became miserable. Like I said earlier, alcohol did one thing for me, and, uh, and that was it made things beyond my wildest dreams come true. Uh, and that it took away the pain and suffering, it put a shroud over all uh, the pain that I had, there was altered perception of reality. But in any case, there was a time where in my drinking where that didn't really happen. That altered perception of reality was not taking place. And that is when I really became depressed. And I was depressed to the state where I could commit suicide at any time. And I was contemplating this. I was contemplating committing suicide because I didn't know a way out. And then on this one very day when I thought that this is the day, the time had come, I had my last drink, a double rum on ice and a, uh, and a king-size coke, and I was on my way to end my life. I got to this crossroad, and at this crossroad I saw cars crisscrossing, shadows, bright lights, and I thought, Al, you know what, maybe there's a jaw at me, let me pull in there and see what's happening, and I did. When I walked in there, there was a few, two rows of chairs on either side, a little table in front, and I pulled a chair and I sat, and there's a guy who walked up in front of me and he said, Welcome, my brew. You are here in the right place. You are here with a bunch of winners. The losers are out there drinking and wasting their lives away. We love you, we care for you, and we have a fellowship that works. That person is in a bigger meeting today. But I'm so thankful, because the only word I heard there was, We love you. When I heard we love you and I check on either side and there's only guys in this meeting, I thought I hit one of those seven year bad luck meetings where guys <laughs> love guys. But thank goodness I, I, I listened. And, and out of that, uh, the whole uh, talk, I just understood one thing, and that there is a place where you can go to, uh, you know, where people have got the same disease that you have. And then I was drunk that night, remember, I was at the end of a binge. But then my next meeting was a week later, and I got there, you know, sober. We spoke about the sponsors in other meetings. In my good old days, we had what was called nominated sponsors. The old-timers will sit together, the so-called old-timers, you respect how many years they had, and they will decide for you who is going to be your sponsor. And then as I, was dry, as I was walking off, this guy came and stopped. He made three attempts because my ego was too big for him. And eventually he was much bigger than I was. And he wanted to throw me into his vehicle. He's also in a bigger meeting today. And he took me to every meeting that I can ever think about in Alcoholics Anonymous. We talk about 90 meetings in 90 days. He took me to meetings far and wide. And, and that is where my strength had grown and today, I want to do whatever I can for the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. Because out of recovery, uh, 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 you, you know, I found myself. Uh, AA, you know, uh, God brought me into Alcoholics Anonymous. And I say that you wonderful people, your God has brought me into uh, Alcoholics Anonymous. At the end of an AA meeting, you'll find that people uh, ask you to cast a thought on all those on the outers, those on park benches, those in, uh, that are drinking in hospitals and asylums. You were praying for me, Gany the alcoholic. Because later on I found out there was no bright lights there, but I did, but I did find the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous by your people's grace. So I found AA uh, through God's grace, and in AA I found God through the book, book, book uh, through the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. Thank you very much for letting me share. My name is Manjin, and I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> a grateful member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And a member of Soweto Group. I just love the just love the topic. You no, know, um, it reminded me that whenever I buy a TV set, it always comes up with the manual book that shows you precisely how the TV is supposed to be used. It even shows you the on and off button. But if I decide that I'm going to switch it on using a screwdriver and I mess it up. Like it, I might take it back to the store and they will give me a new one. But one thing for sure, they will, they will still give me the same manual book. 
That means the suggestion or the steps won't change and work the way I want them to work. Please allow me to be simple, speak for myself and not for AA as a whole. You know, when I look at, when I look at the topic, something said to me, this doesn't need a brain surgery to figure, a brain surgery to figure the answer out. I mean, I know that in order to have what you people have, I need to follow the path. The people say, really have you seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed our path? So I don't have to follow my own path. I need to follow your path. You know, me and simplicity, I'm not familiar with simplicity. It's not in my DNA. I don't know how to keep things simple. You see, my brain is wired differently. I'll give you an example. But before, somewhere in the big book I've read that my sickness centers in the mind. Now, I'll give you an example. If a lady asks me to you know, help her with the shoes and probably she's wearing a miniskirt, my mind will say, she wants you. <laughs> you know? and, and, and I'll be convinced. When she wants me to help her with the zip, you know, to zip it all the way up, my mind says, yeah, don't ever <laughs> underestimate small beginnings. <laughs> she wants you to see her back before you come to the front. That's, that's, how I, that's how my mind is, you know? Yeah, so the chapter five says, those who do not recover are people who cannot or will not completely give themselves to the simple problem. Give, you know, which means allow or permit or to grant. So I know that I need to give myself into this simple program. One of the things I asked myself when I was preparing for this talk is, do I know what you people have? Do I really want what you people have? And what is it that you people have? I remember when I went to the rooms from the first time, I also was baffled and perplexed. Because I didn't see any alcoholics. I just saw beautiful people like right now. You know? So I, I didn't really understand it. how is it possible that alcoholics can look so beautiful. You guys are beautiful. One thing I saw, I saw joy. I, I saw peace. You know? and, and I wanted that. I also wanted the tranquility. You know? And I knew exactly what I want. From, from the rooms. You know, the big book says, there is one who has all power, and that one is God. May you find him now. That is simple and straight. It says find him now. So you know, um, procrastination is part of my DNA. I always thought that God is for the old people, the ones that are about to die. You know, the ones that are left with only the big reflect. But you know, the big book says, find him now. So I knew I had to find God, because hey, I've tried many ways to you know, um, quit drinking, but I couldn't. It wasn't easy to find God, because I always had resentment towards God. I felt like God is for others and not me. I mean, if God was really there, how could he watch me suffer like this? So probably he's not even um, near me. But I think God that I was more, I was willing enough to listen to you guys. Because you said to me, I need to find my own conception of God, the God, the way I understand God, you know? And to me, it felt like that was blasphemy. I felt like you saying I must create my own God. And my mother always told me, hey, Manda, worship no other God but God. So I came into this room, you guys are telling me to have my own conception, you know? And I understood that you were saying, I do not have to create the Creator because that is impossible. But I can just find my own understanding of God, you know? And the way I understand God now, it's so wonderful. Today I know that God is love. He's the God that forgives and forgets. Thanks to you guys, now I have my own conception of God. Like I said, keeping things easier, I've, I've always had a problem with that. You know, um, and one of the reasons now I know I need to keep, the only way I could keep things easier when it comes to the program is to, re, to remove myself, you know, remove that self and, and, and put God. Uh, um, 
I suffer from self, the easy, the I self and me. And, and the only way I could keep it simple is to just to deal with that easy, which is, which is I self and me. Four years back, I was in a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. And today here I am telling my story to, to all you fine people. Judging from where I came from, I'm doing pretty good, if you ask me. Now, um, I believe that I wouldn't be where I, where I am right now if it wasn't for the, the, the creative intelligence, which is the spirit of the universe, the goddess I understand. You see, you guys taught me that acceptance is the key to all my problems that I had need to admit. Now I admit that I'm powerless, not only over alcohol or drugs, because those are just a symptom. I'm powerless over many, many things. I'm powerless over money. I'm powerless over people. I'm powerless over women. I'm powerless over sex. In fact, let me tell you something about sex. <laughs> See, sex is a mind-altering substance. <laughs> it can take you to places you have never been sober. You know, so those are the things that overpowered me. So I, I had to find a power that is more powerful than the things that overpowered me. And I only found that power when I was introduced into this world. So when they talk about worshiping, you know, that you can only worship. You know those small gods they make using wood and steel? But I was surprised when I got here. There was also a worshiper of men. That I was a worshiper of people. I worship alcohol. I worship that. Alcohol was my god. I couldn't do anything without the use of alcohol. But now I have a power that is more powerful than alcohol which is the core of my own understanding. I just want to thank each and every one of you, especially my uh, Soweto group, for being there for me. You know, um, I am because of you guys. Thank you very much um, for showing me that it is possible. It is because of you now I understand that I'm doing a spiritual program. You take away spirituality, I don't have the program. Now I know the difference between the fellowship and the problem. And I need you fellows to give me that strength. But when it comes to a program, it's a one-man show. I do it for myself and not, not for anybody else. It is because of you guys. I'm, I'm a father. I'm a son to my parents. I'm a productive member. And I think I like to think that I'm a loving boyfriend. Thanks to you guys. Hi, my name is Isha, and I'm a very grateful alcoholic. I should have been up here a little earlier, but uh, I'm powerless over so many things, like Mandla just said, including the means by which I was supposed to get here. But thank goodness and thank God that I'm here. I'm so grateful and privileged to be here and to be sharing what I can share. I am from Uganda in East Africa. I'm a member of the Turning Point group, which meets every Wednesday and uh, Friday in Kampala. And if anyone of you is around that neighborhood, please drop by. We always welcome you with open arms. This topic, why is this simple program really hard? I did not prepare for this topic, so I'm going to speak off the cup. And uh, I was told that usually that's the, the, the most truthful share. And I also know this program tells me to share my experience, strength, and, and hope, whatever it is. So that's what I'm going to try to do. Um, by the grace of God, I found my sobriety in the rooms of AA, and I've stayed sober. Getting here, like somebody once told me, my, my mother never planned that I would be a member of AA. 
and I agreed with her. I had to never plan to be a member of AA. In fact, for the last seven years of my drinking, it had been suggested to me countless times that I should try AA, and I had refused consistently. The only times I went for an AA meeting were when I wanted to let the pressure off, when I wanted to demonstrate that I was trying to do something about my drinking. And uh, I think that partly explains why this simple program is so hard. The big book uh, somewhere talks about nobody likes the leveling of pride, the self-facing, the honesty that is required for this to work. It's, it's almost as if the only thing that stands between me and freedom is my ego, my pride, my selfishness, my self-centeredness. The big book also says that uh, selfishness, self-centeredness, that is the root of our problems. And uh, it says driven by a hundred forms of fear and so many other things. We step on the toes of others. It also says that the only reason I drink is to change how I'm feeling. That I'm restless, irritable, and discontented until I, I experience the sense of ease and comfort that comes at once. And that was always very important for me, at once. Drinks which I see others take with uh, impunity. Now, that has always been the problem. The problem is, I, I interpret my reality based on my feelings. I interpret the uh, reality, I interpret your faces based on how you make me feel. I could look through that door, see somebody walking, and because they are not smiling, I say, I don't like them. It's that simple. Selfishness, self-centeredness. That is the root of my problem. And this simple program requires that I put everything aside. I stop relying on myself and start relying on a power greater than myself. And people I can share with you, and I'm very sure that if you sober through AA, you will attest to the fact that that is not always a very simple proposition. Somebody once said it's a simple program for very complicated people. I consider myself one of those. Under the lash of alcoholism, as the book says, we come into AA. The alcohol itself beats us into reasonableness, and that was the case for me. I drank for 20 years, the last seven of which were literal hell. And uh, it didn't matter what, what evidence physically was presented to me that this alcohol was taking me, I would say this time it will be different. It was so simple for me to get up in the morning with a hangover, with the guilt and shame and remorse of the previous day, I just get up and say, this time it will be different. Some of the reasons I gave always uh, seemed reasonable to me. I would say, last night it was so bad because I drank before I ate. And the next night it will be, you know, it was so bad because I drank after eating too much. That's why I, I threw up. And then there would be things like, I drank, it was so bad because I was drinking with the wrong company. I should change bars, I should change, those guys drink too much, I should change, you know. There was all, it was so important for me to find a solution to my drinking problem. By the way, in the last seven, eight years of my drinking, there was no question, I knew I had a problem. You know, when you come into AA, you ask, do you have a problem and do you need help? Which are very, two very critical questions. Do you have a problem? In the last seven years of my drinking, I said, yes, I knew that I had a problem. There was no doubt about that. I could see it for myself. Do you need help? No. I'll do it my way. It was so important for me to find a solution my way because that, I thought, would leave my ego, my pride intact. And it seemed so important that I find a solution to alcohol without asking for help. And that, I think, is what makes this program so difficult for a person like me. It's a simple program, 
but my ego stands in the way. So I'll not dwell too much on that. I'll just, I'll just move on to share my experience about how this simple program has worked eventually. I believe that the whole purpose of this program, as we read it in the book, is to find a relationship with a, a power greater than myself who, who will solve my problem. And not just my problem, but all my problems. A relationship with God as I understand Him. I can tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that today I enjoy a relationship with God as I understand Him in a way that is indescribably wonderful. That power greater than myself has enabled me finally to look myself in the mirror and say, I like what I'm seeing. I can look in the mirror and say, you know, you're good company. I'm comfortable under my skin, in my own skin, and I don't have to wake up every morning wondering what it is I did this time. That, for me, is the first gift of, of sobriety of this program, the unity of my body, my mind, and my spirit. I feel a complete human being once more. The other gift of this program is that my relationship with other people, all of you, have, gone, have undergone a revolution. And I don't have to be the person I was before. And the third is, of course, like I said, my relationship with my higher power, as I understand him. You see, my problem, when I say that the problem was always my ego, somebody described it as conscious separation. At a conscious level, at the level of my thoughts and my ideas and emotions, I felt separate. And because I felt separate, I didn't feel that I had anything to do with you. I didn't feel that I had anything to do with my higher power. In fact, God, as I understand him, would never take me in because I had messed up so bad and so full of guilt, shame, and remorse. And then this simple program told me, you see, you have to put everything aside. One of the big problems that you have, and my, my first sponsor used to tell it to me over and over and over, that Isha, the problem of the alcoholic centers in the mind, and he says that your finest moments, the best that you can do as a manager of your life was the day you walked into AA. That was you at your best. And I know that today. I know that if I am to ever have a meaningful life, today I enjoy my life. I don't attribute it to how smart I am or how good I am. I have to be open to the idea that I am not a very good manager of my life. I have to be open to the idea that left on my own, my mind is going to tell me to, get, to head down the road to, to alcohol. And that is like my default status. I need the power greater than myself. And that power greater than myself is God as I understand him. It's the fellowship of AA, all of you people, and it's my program. The program, the steps. Because those steps, every time I do them, they keep my ego in check. They keep me open to the idea that I can rely on the power greater than myself, who is you, who is God. And so, that, I believe, is the solution to this very simple program. It's actually the solution to my very big ego. I just have to do the steps. I have to follow directions. I have to be accountable to a sponsor. I have to do service. Every time I do service, it opens my mind to the idea that, look, it's just a drink away, and I can be like that, still suffering alcohol, who is doing his first step, even as I do my 12th step. I would like to end by saying that uh, it's been a very incredible journey of sobriety and I'm open to the idea that there's even more to come. The best years of my life lie ahead, I believe, if I only keep coming back. I bring you greetings from Uganda and would like to take this opportunity to invite you to the, the first international convention of AA that we are organizing. This November, you're all welcome. It's in November from 1st to the 4th, and uh, everyone will be expecting everyone who is here. Thank you very much.
much for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.